How to find a common understanding for mobility. Hi, my name is Marcin Wojciech Zebrowski, and this is the newest episode of Herbcast, my podcast about urbanism, architecture, cities, and many more. Welcome to the newest episode of Herbcast and Urban Future series, which was recorded during the Urban Future Conference 2022 in Helsingborg. I am very, very happy to share another conversation, which is the result of my collaboration with Urban Future as a media partner. I was honored to be able to sit together with a couple of the guests of the conference and talk to them about different themes related to urbanism, cities, and also many more. Today I will be talking to Carolina Cominotti about how to find a common understanding for mobility. Carolina Cominotti is the head of partnerships at Autonomy Paris, which is one of the biggest, or actually the biggest, fair of mobility. And we are discussing why is it important to get a common understanding of mobility and how the interest in mobility started in, in Carolina's case. We are debunking mobility. We are talking about what is mobility, but what also mobility is not. And also how to understand mobility in the midst of all the changes in our cities. For example, the electric scooters, which are actually everywhere in our cities right now. And I'm wondering how is our image of mobility changing because of those. We are thinking about the paradigm shift. We are also discussing the paradigm shift in thinking about mobility and also about the autonomy Paris. So why is it worth to visit the autonomy the mobility fair in Paris? What would mean success for the organizers after the event? And who has the biggest power if it comes to shaping mobility? Is it the city halls, the decision makers in the city councils, or is it the private companies? maybe universities or maybe just the users who should be in the position of making the changes and decisions if it comes to mobility and how is it being shaped in the world. We finish with a book recommendation, but also with a very big question, what could mobility look like in 50 years? So welcome to the newest talk with Carolina Cominotti, which is a part of the Herbcast and Urban Future series. Carolina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very pleased that we can talk about the mobility and maybe try to understand the mobility together with the with the listeners of the podcast. But before that, I think that it would be fair if we started with a uh, with short story uh, behind your, your interest, because we've been just discussing that we both graduated as designers. But we kind of took a bit different paths because I'm working now more with business development and you are working more with partnerships and mobility. So how did it happen? (laughs) Okay, so I'm an architect and urban planner. I'm from Brazil originally. And in Brazil, this university, this course is merged. So you are trained as an architect and urban planner. So after Mm. five years of study, you can be out in the world and present yourself as an architect and urban planner. But during the university, I've understood that I like it more urbanism and urban planning than architecture. And then I decided that I needed to do a deep dive on it to understand even more. So I wanted to do a master only of urban planning. And um, I've searched a lot and Paris has this very undoubtable (laughs) reputation (laughs) on urban planning. And they claim alongside Barcelona to be one of the places where urban planning was born. And they have a very interesting approach because in France, they separated urban planning from everything else. So you don't uh, graduate in license as urban Mm. planner, but only master. So you do license in whatever you want. It can be architecture, it can be geography, it can be law, and then you become a master in urban planning. So people come from lots of backgrounds and this is really interesting. So I went uh, to Paris and stayed there 
two years, almost three in the, in the end, because I also worked there for the City Hall of Paris. So it was a very intense time. And well, while I was studying ur- urban planning, I fell in love with public spaces, especially mm. walking and cycling. So yeah. the I always studied the, the relation between what is built and mm. the behavior of people, how they behave because of the, that infrastructure. Mm. So I started with uh, walking and cycling, and it became kind of my passion, active mobility. And finally, I, well, kind of started evolving. And I already worked uh, also in the city of Sao Paulo, where I am from. So it's a huge city of 22 million people. (laughs) And, uh, well, it was very interesting because, of course, like moving people around in such a huge scale, it's uh, very very challenging, but also Mm. very passionate. And that's, uh, well, that was my path. And nowadays I work closely with public policy. So at the very early stage of um, of where mobility is created, so trying to bridge the actors of mobility. Let's try to think about what mobility exactly is, because you've mentioned that you enjoyed walking. And, And walking, in my understanding, it is mobility as well. Of course, uh, it is so totally. What, what's what's your under understanding of mobility? Because I think that it is also popular to study mobility, to do some reports about mobility, to also consider mobility into urban planning. But yeah, how do you understand mobility? But I guess this is nowadays because I graduated almost ten years ago mm. uh, in in this master that I've I've telling you. And uh, well, it was a huge fight with my teacher because he didn't want me to talk about walking. He thought it was something really basic and not very like in sidewalks, especially because um, in Brazil, sidewalks, they are made by the proprietary of the tearing nearby. So it's a very crazy patchwork. of uh, <laughs> It's not made by the public sector. So it's right. for me, it was really shocking to see when I first came to Europe that everything was really neat in the public space. And I was like, oh, my God, uh, it could be different. So I guess mobility, yes, nowadays it's, it, this term became really popular, but 10 years ago it was not. And uh, it was much more about uh, transportation. And I guess now people, especially because of technology, we kind of drift away from uh, transportation per se and started seeing mobility in a more broader approach. So I personally think that mobility is about choices and having mm. and being able of doing these choices and going from A to B in the way that suits you best at that moment. Because Mm. sometimes you're carrying children, sometimes you're (laughs) carrying shopping groceries, sometimes you want to to take your time and have a look around, sometimes Mm. you want to do it like in a very rapid way. So I think it's all about choices. But personally, as I'm an urban planner, I also think that is really linked to housing. We cannot forget about that because sometimes even the lack of mobility, it's because people are really far away from their centers of interest. So this is something that we need to consider as well. Okay, and then let's try to reverse that. What (laughs) mobility is not to you? What mobility is not? Wow, that's a very tricky one because uh, nowadays, I guess, like every time that we move, Uh, we are talking about mobility, but I guess that we've all suffered a lot with the lack of mobility and not having mobility during the lockdowns that we face it through the COVID. And I guess we understood even better how important it is for us going around and to move. So not having mobility is something really tricky. But I guess mobility is It's not about technology, it's about choices, it's not about uh, this software or that important thing. But I I guess it's a real understanding, it's public policy oriented, trying to aim it in a way that it's good for society as a whole, even if you also have your choices individually. So I guess this is the most tricky part. Mm. 
I'm asking about this mobility and what is not mobility, because I think there might be some harmful connotations that make it harder to understand mobility. And I mean here that a couple of years ago, there was like a huge wave of uh, electric scooters that appeared on the streets of many, many cities. All cities. Yes, exactly. All cities. It it became like a new wave of, of new device. And even now recording here, we have a very nice view on the on the sea. And I can just see like already one scooter just, just being parked there. And I at least think that it is a still new device in our public spaces. And I think that some people perceive that as also the companies brand themselves, that it is the new mobility. But is that the real image? Should we really treat electric scooters as, as this new mobility or Rather, the the mobility is so complex that this electric scooter is just like a tiny piece of that that is not that important. I think it became a component. So as you just mentioned, like they popped up in every city escape uh, some years ago. I was personally working for the City Hall of Sao Paulo. I was advising the deputy mayor of mobility and we had there 16 operators that popped up. Uh, well, it's a big city, but like lots of operators wanted a piece of that market. And for us and for everyone working in the public sector was a very, like, uh, how? what do we do with them? <laughs> how do we regulate them? If something happens, who is the the person that is responsible? And of course, the public sector is always running after the technology because uh, Public sector, it's all about the public money. It's funded by our taxes. So we have lots of procedures when we talk about the public sector. And they cannot move as fast as the the private companies in that sense. So when those uh, engines came up, everyone was like, oh my God, what do we do with that? And um, well, now they are part of uh, the streetscape and lots of cities embraced them. Others banished them. And I guess cities are trying to understand what works because it's not just about going copy paste what works in some scape, it's going to work Mm. in another. So I guess they are part of it. And we are going to see as it happened for shared mobility back in 2014 when Uber popped up and everybody was like, oh my God, what do we do with that? And taxes were going crazy. And even have we had a mass suicidal from taxi cab drivers in New York, for instance, as a protest. So it was, well, we are living very like effervescent times. So I guess mobility is evolving and uh, we need to understand what is better for each city and for the planet itself, because we are also facing a climate crisis. So I guess we will see, I guess, lots of this new mobility popping up, but it's not about that. It's not about the cool tech, it's about uh, having choices and these choices being really good for both the people of uh, such a city and for the planet as well. Is mobility a good business? Is it a business case? Because we mentioned the scooters and you you said that there are like 16 companies that, that started to operate. And I assume at least that if so many companies suddenly appear to be interested in mobility that much and start with the electric scooters, it means that there is some money because people can use it. At the same time, I was reading, I think yesterday, that Uber, even though it's working for many years now, it is still not profitable. It's not profitable. Yes, it's crazy, but it, it is true. It's But we move all the time, right? And sometimes we, of course, need to use more advanced device or we just need to use uh, something that will transport us for a longer distance. And we, I think we are ready to pay the price. But do you think that mobility can be a good business? Well, we've been working with this for years and it's as a business, I guess it's kind of tricky because, uh, well, it's not so evident and still sometimes controversial because uh, even for shared mobility, there are some reports saying that shared mobility increases the number of uh, cars on the street. So it depends, I guess. But as I was saying, like sometimes we really need that component to move around because, for instance, you're not going to get 
trunk of a wedding party and enter driving a bike home. It depends where you live. Maybe in a very small city, you can do that. But In Copenhagen, you can order a taxi, which has a special place where you can put your bike on, on the back. Yeah. So even if you are drunk, you technically yeah. can go back by bike. <laughs> but I also heard that in Copenhagen, you can get a fine if you're drink Might driving, <laughs> even in, in bikes. So I guess, well, it's a tricky business because it's really evolving. It's really new. But I guess it's really important also, and we are getting there, I guess, accommodating all these needs and, and the market is understanding better the real needs. And of course, when something new pops up, yes, like 16 operators, but they are not there anymore as well. So mm. because we can also think about the case of uh, the OFO bikes and Mobike in China when there was back in time like uh, a huge mass amount of uh, free floating bikes and yeah. and they became uh, like really popular and then after it was a big bubble that exploded and like we have tons and tons of uh, dead bikes in piles around China so what happened to that like why was there this shift did people stop using them there was so much so much offer so much offer like because it, think people thought that this would be a trend and then we started seeing like uh, thousands and thousands of bikes because they were not regulated by the government so in sao paulo when this popped up uh, we made the regulation before they arrived so it was good in that sense because we already had a, a regulation so mm. when these new devices come up the public sector is like oh my god what do i do with that this is brand new there is nothing in the law that i can refer to and and they have to create new ones. So I guess that's why it's also very important for cities to exchange with each other because this peer knowledge is really valuable. So it, and that's also what we we try to do a lot at autonomy, put people in conversation. Because in that sense, I guess the public sector, the private sector, the NGOs and academia, they speak very different languages. Mm. They have very different reasons for being. And in that sense, sometimes they don't understand each other because they are driven by different uh, things. Mm. But if we don't collaborate as a whole, as a society, we're not moving forward. So that's something that I always try to be the bridge wherever I am to see the both sides of everything, of every story, because I guess it's important to understand what is driving those changes and how the city is perceiving them, how the companies are perceiving them and working together to make it better for the citizens. It's good that you mentioned autonomy because this is uh, the topic I wanted to start as well, because we are talking about Autonomy Paris, the, the world's leading event dedicated to sustainable mobility. And since you are meeting with so many people who are working in the field of mobility from different sides of spectrum. That's why I'm also asking you about this business part, because it feels very interesting to me what is like your feeling, because if you talk to someone who is, for example, taking care of the mobility in a city council, and then you are meeting someone who is a businessman and would like to promote the, their mobility device, let it be the electric scooters or, or Uber drivers and so on. So these are like two worlds. And do you think that it's possible for them to meet somehow? Is it a compromise? And where are the, the users in all of this equation? That's exactly what we try to do at, at Autonomy. So we are an organization that we host this annu annual event called Autonomy Paris. So once a year, we gather together all our network and it's B2B and B2G event. So this is the very important component, which I'm proudly <laughs> happy to be the, the person that is, is doing this outreach and taking care of this B2G component in, at Autonomy, because exactly what we do is trying to the bridge and make these people get together and understand and make the solutions go faster and advance faster. So at Autonomy, we, Autonomy Paris, we have this gathering once a year, which is really it's a big event, it's a trade show, there are booths, there are talks, there are conversations. Like It's really, really huge. It's a two-day event. But we also have uh, smaller events that we call the, the City Summit. So we just finished one in Berlin. 
what we do in those events, it's exactly the opposite. We First, we partner with the city and we try to bring our international community and downscale our big conference into the city to have a zoom in and understand what the city is needing. And then what we do from there, once we partner with the city, we try to understand what the city is facing in terms of uh, mobility challenges. And then we ask to our network of players that uh, who wants to address those issues and understand that. So in the case of Berlin, it was the mobility hubs. So it was very interesting because uh, Berlin has Yelby, which is both an application, also stations inside. And we discussed it a lot about that. And we have also coming the autonomous vehicles, London City Summit. So it's going to be in October. So the thing is, we try to do this two different uh, ways of events. And we also have our content running the throughout the year. So we produce lots of webinars, white papers, and we are always having this overview of what is happening in the mobility landscape through our newsletter, the Urban Mobility Weekly, that it goes out every Thursday. And, uh, well, it's a very interesting way of uh, putting these uh, people that speak different languages together to try to uh, discuss and move forward. Since you are talking to many people from different fields, I mean, from mobility, but from different sites, as I mentioned before, what is your kind of main takeaway from those talks? Because thousands of people gather and you have a chance to talk with all different partners. And do you observe any trends that appear in mobility? As we discussed before, mobility It's not about technology, right? It's not just about technology. It's, it's not just about technology. It's it's about the choice. So what is the kind of the, the main observation of yours if it comes to the mobility and the, and the new trends? Well, I guess we have lots of things popping up and very interesting things. As I said, we can see this way of Yelby operating is really, really interesting. It's totally a case because it's the public sector creating a platform that enables lots of operators to be all in one place. So mm. it's the city that uh, got closer to mobility as a service, not only talking about it, but really doing and, and seeing out there. But I guess lots of things are, are happening now as we are facing a very, lots of crisis, as a matter of fact, because right. we, we are trying to bounce back from the the huge pandemic that we just kind of finished now. And the public uh, transportation is struggling a lot. So people are now getting back, but well, it, they they had a very tough moment. And uh, well, I guess as of now, uh, walking and cycling has like a super proeminent place in the mobility landscape more than ever. And I, I think that's really valuable because it's the most It's the basics way of moving around uh, we, where we don't pollute at all. So I guess the combination of all these things are really interesting. What we are trying to do at Autonomy, and I think uh, when we started uh, like uh, in 2016, we were kind of the outcasters, we are the outsiders. And now people come to us and say, hey guys, you're doing something pretty interesting. And now it became a trend, is moving from the single car ownership to any other thing. Like, <laughs> I guess uh, this thing that is what we don't want, like people moving in their own cars around in cities, occupying lots of space and polluting. So this is what we are trying to go like as far away as possible, especially in, in city centers, and then trying to combine all of the other ways of moving around. As I said previously, trying to use mobility in a way that serves you and also the planet and also in a way that you can choose what is best in the moment uh, that you are. You mm. can go walking, you can visit a friend cycling and you can go grocery shopping and come back in a cargo bike. You can do, I don't know, come back from a party drunk uh, in a shared uh, cab or in a cab. So I guess the composition of this 
is what is the trend now. Mm. You said that you work with B2B and, and B2G, just to explain that it's working business to business and business to government. Yes, exactly. Uh, which is very interesting because I haven't heard a lot of B2G operations in companies because it's often that we focus on this B2B aspect. So please tell us, like, how is it to be in the dialogue with the G, with the governments and with the city halls? How do they portray mobility when you talk? Yes, of course. I guess they are the main players of mobility because they do the regulation and they choose to what is going to to be having on their cityscape or not. So I guess they are a key component mm. and a major player because it, it's literally in their backyard that all this moving around is happening. But of course, as I mentioned previously, they are very particular because they are tied to the procedures of the public sector. And that's great because we live in democracies and and it's really good to know that like when you pay your tax, your money has uh, to be used in a certain way that it's at least intended to be the best for everyone else. So the public sector, as a matter of fact, they are the guardians of uh, the public interest. So that's what they are there for, to regulate some abuses or, or enhance things that they are not in trend, but they are important. So I guess this is their very key hole. And um, well, it's a, it's a very important player to be ignored. So I guess hearing what the cities are facing, trying to understand what they are in need, what are their, like the particular crisis that we are facing now. So it was very interesting because last Autonomy Paris, we've partnered with lots of cities. We have lots of cities in our network, but the city of Rio de Janeiro came to Paris and the deputy mayor said, I want a new ticketing system for Rio and I wanted to meet like other operators than what I already have back in Brazil and I'm already used to. And it was very nice because we could put them in contact with so many interesting European operators and companies that could tackle those issues for the city of Rio. So I guess it's a win-win finally, but you need to refine the conversation and understand what the city needs and then try to match partners mm. that can solve that problem for them. So who has the biggest power if it comes to shaping mobility? Well, I guess it's a, it's a shared power finally. It's oh. that that's also the tricky part of it because uh, it relies a lot on the population and what the, their choices of moving around, but this can be shaped also both by the public sector with their regulations enhancing one modes and discouraging others. And of course, uh, the market, we live in a capitalist world, we cannot ignore the market. So lots of things that are really convenient and affordable and interesting shapes also mobility. So that's why mobility is a bit tricky because it's a shared power. It's something that uh, there is not just one player. It's cities. Cities are like that. I guess that's what I what drove me a bit away from architecture and what got me so much into urban planning and also the public sector and also mobility is because it's a fair percent. It's, it's never ending, as a matter of <laughs> fact. Like, uh, it's very nice when you end a building and it's, uh, it's good to go and everybody's taking the use of it, but uh, then it's over. And in urban planning, everything is always evolving. You're never going to, like, oh, this city is finished. No, it's an ongoing masterpiece, mm. as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, to end on this more um, personal note, but of course, it probably will be backed up with a lot of knowledge and experience you have from your professional work. What do you think that mobility will look like in the future? For example, in, in 50 years? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> We are uh, at the Urban Future Conference. I, I can't not ask you about the future. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, I have, I tend to be an optimistic person because I need that to believe. Like uh, I always see the, the glass always half full. <laughs> so <laughs> it is what 
I think we need now to make this change that we definitely need, because if we see the reports, we are in a very complicated situation. So if we don't act now, this future cannot be that bright. So I think, well, I, I hope <laughs> as a matter of thinking, but I, I really hope that we have lots of space for walking and cycling, that public transit is the backbone and it's affordable and, and people can uh, move like very huge distances in a good uh, system. And uh, that the cool tech, the technology enters to enhance all those things, but we don't lose sight of what is important and have this combined in what is already exists. So I really think that it's not only about all what is to come, but also sticking to basic things and making room for the important things like walking, cycling and public transit and assuring that this works well, especially in city centers. Mm. But I, I also hope that lots of things evolve in terms of technology, of merging ways of payment. I guess these are things that are, we are going to, to see lots of change and this is really, really good and interesting mm. as well. I'm also an, an optimist so uh, myself, so I hope that the, the future will be bright. <laughs> Let's hope for that. Hope and work for that. Hope and Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I really like that, what you said. I think that's the key, right? It's not only about hoping, but it's also about working. Towards, Towards, right? towards yes, this, this, this positive scenario. And I think that there is one more thing I would like to ask you, and it is about the Education, I think it's it's also like extremely, extremely important component of us developing mobility. And not only, would you like to recommend any book that could be maybe about the topic of mobility, but not necessarily, but something that you could share with the listeners? Yes, definitely. I'm going to drift away from the classic architecture urban planning books because, of course, I could say, hi, ah, guys. Go read, I don't know, Jane Jacobs and <sighs> Cities for People and lots of interesting books that are great. But as we are in this optimist vibe and looking <laughs> towards the future, my fiance is a data scientist and we are together for five years. And it's, a good match. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he completely changed my way of seeing things. And I, I stole a book from his and I found it amazing. And it's called Factfulness. And it's from Hans Hosling. He passed away uh, recently, but his book is amazing. It's really optimistic and we really, he zooms out of everything we believe that is going really bad in the world and things are not going like the way we thought it should be. He zooms out and with data, he shows us that, yes, the world is improving a lot and at the same time, it has a lot to be done still, but for us to keep a to keep an eye on on all of this. So I really recommend Factfulness, and the title of the book is uh, Factfulness: uh, Ten Reasons We Are Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. So I guess this is really really good recommendation. So I I will suggest this for zooming out and giving us a little hope. Carolina, thank you very much for not only the, the recommendation, but also for your positive attitude, because I think that nowadays we need it a lot. And yeah, let's hope for, let's hope and work for, yes, let's uh, hope for, and the, work. for the good future. Uh, yes. If it comes to the mobility and, and not only because, as you said, cities are complicated. In a good way. Organized <laughs> in a good way. And, they, and it's never possible to, to see a city as a finished yeah. Um, masterpiece, right? Yes. It's, it's something that ongoing it's evolving, ongoing, developing all the time. So thank you for, for sharing this perspective in the podcast. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I loved it. It was very inspiring. So thank you for having me and hope this conversation inspires lots of uh, other young professionals as well, because they are also with us on this quest of uh, making cities better. And I hope we're going to meet again. So I just will say, see you. See you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Herbcast. And if you are still listening to that, if you are still here with me, I wanted to say thank you so much for uh, being here, for supporting this podcast. And if you like it, 
please share it with one person that also might find it interesting. If you would like to contact me or visit the social media of the podcast, you can find me at Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, but also at the website herbcast.pl slash en for English. Thank you very much and talk to you very, very soon. Thank you.